Let's see if we can shed some light on Holy Sonnet 14 by the poet John Donne, which was published in 1633, a couple of years after his death. Now this is a beautiful poem, a powerful poem, and it's about spiritual struggle. It's about one's longing for God, uh, for God to actually come into one's heart and to convert one and to make one believe. So it's a powerful poem, but you might be surprised, surprised to see that it's also a sonnet because we tend to think of sonnets as your basic love poem and it may seem strange to address God in these kinds of terms. So it is worthwhile to remember that there is this kind of mystical tradition in which that love longing for the divine is often put in the most sensual terms. So don't be entirely surprised by some of the terminology here. There, there is a tradition that this is part of. And yet John Donne is going out of his way to startle us. He does want to surprise us with the kind of violence of his imagery. Now this is what's called a Petrarchan sonnet. So a Petrarchan sonnet named after the Italian poet Petrarch. Okay, let's just fix that in here for a moment. Okay, um, and a Petrarchan sonnet typically consists of two parts. We have the first eight lines, and that's called the octave. The octave, octo is eight. And then we have the sestet at the end, which is the last six lines. Remember that a sonnet is always 14 lines long. In the middle, we have what's called a poetic turn. So the word yet here really introduces a shift from some kind of problem to hopefully some sort of solution. And we call this a, a poetic turn, or in the original uh, Italian, it's called a volta, okay, a turn to something else. If you look at the rhyme scheme here, uh, you can see that the octave has only two rhymes, A and B, and the sestet also has just two rhymes. Although the sestet, the, the rhyming scheme in the sestet in the Petrarchan sonnet tends to vary quite a bit, quite a bit um, as opposed to in the octave. There's also one line that doesn't seem quite to rhyme here with I, which is supposed to rhyme with enemy. Uh, but, you know, if you're a great poet, you can force it a little bit. Let's dig in and let's see what this poem is actually about. So the first quatrain, the first four lines, start with batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend. That I, may, that I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Now you can probably hear that there's a kind of violence to this imagery. We have the alliteration with break, blow, burn, and make me new. And we really have the sense that God needs to come to the poet and not just say nice things and say, why don't you believe in me, but really use a battering ram to get through the gate into his heart and to convert him and make him into a changed person. So that the violence here is important. You can see that in the, in, in the, the meter as well. So sonnets are typically written in iambic pentameter, iambic pentameter, and the penta here means five, and an iam, so this first little bit, an iam up to the b, that's where we have two syllables. The first is unstressed, and this, the second one is stressed. And if you do that five times, then you have iambic pentameter, so 10 syllables in a line. Now this sonnet starts off with not an I am, but with what's called a trochee. And that's deliberate, as we'll see in a second. So a trochee is the opposite of an I am. We start with a stressed syllable, and then we have an unstressed syllable. You wouldn't say batter my heart, right? You say batter my heart. So stress first, and then unstressed. But then it goes back to a regular iambic pentameter rhythm. So we have my heart, three purse, and God for you, and so on. And you can see then that this trochee at the beginning is powerful because it, it's a very aggressive start. Iambic pentameter is kind of nice and smooth, and, you know, pa pum, pa pum, pa pum. But the poet doesn't want God to be nice and easy with him. He wants to 
um, batter him. He wants to. Uh, he wants him to to beat on his door. And so when poets do this, when they mix it up like that, that and they use a trochee, uh, they really want form and content to go together. Right? Form equals content. So we want something a little rougher here to start us off, and that, that's definitely very powerful. In the, the rest of the line here, we have a reference to three-person God, and that's, of course, a reference to the Trinity. And some people see the next line as a reference as well to the three persons of the Trinity, that we have these three terms here, and each one goes back to a particular member of the Trinity. That does make some sense. So, for instance, shine, right? We have the sun, and there's a kind of pun here on sun. The sun shines on us. We have the Holy Spirit, who is traditionally seen as inspiring us. And the word inspiration or inspire goes back to Latin. Inspiration, uh, inspiro in Latin means to breathe into. So we can see that the Holy Spirit does breathe into people. Although when you read the second chapter of Genesis, you do see that God, when he creates people, he also breathes into. Uh, life into them. So the same term is used not just for the Holy Spirit, but also for the Father. And then knock, perhaps this refers more to the activity of the Father. But as you can see, this this uh, specific Trinitarian way of thinking is already starting to break down a little bit. So there are references to the, tr the three members of the Trinity here, but all of these ter terms also remind us that God is one single God and not just three separate uh, persons. Okay, so we have references to what God does, but these things are very mild so far, right? He's just politely knocking on the door of John Donne's heart. He's breathing, he's shining, but it's not really enough. And that's where we start to get our first major paradox of the poem. He says that I may rise and stand or throw me. And you can take this word that, and you could interpret this as meaning in order that. So what it's really saying then is in order that I may rise, you're going to have to overthrow me. You're going to have to push me down, right? And that's the only way for me to actually stand up for you and to be your servant. So that's our first paradox. And when we think of a paradox, a paradox is a statement that seems to be a contradiction on the surface. Two things are kind of coming into conflict. But when we look more closely, we see that it sort of makes sense at the same time. And that's the, the beauty of the paradox. And he says, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. This is another paradox because, of course, if you, if you burn things down, if you destroy them, they're hardly going to be new. Right? So a couple of paradoxes here that get us to this idea that to be converted first takes a kind of radical destruction uh, and a pushing over before we can rise up and stand up for God. So that's the first quatrain. And in the second quatrain, John Donne starts to use a new uh, kind of image. And this is the idea of a town. So we have a town, right? And there are armies outside and this is the army of the devil as we find out soon enough this army is besieging the town and this particular town is also compared in another image to the body so you can think of the body as a town as well now I'll just make this a sort of snowman body there you go okay so these images are going to come together uh, and they're going to be quite similar because in a town you typically have a governor a governor in the poem this is called a viceroy and in a person you have something that governs you and that would be your reason right your reason governs you as a person so if you think of those two images then you can make sense of the next little bit he says i like a usurped town, usurped means taken over, to another do, labor to admit you. So the you here is God, right? God is also trying to get into this town and into this person. And in the meantime, the town is not letting God in because there's somebody else who's there uh, who is attacking, and that's the devil. 
That's why he says, reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend. So reason should say, hey, there is a God, right? We can prove the existence of God through our mental efforts. Uh, we should be able to say that it's reasonable to believe in God, and yet reason is departing from him. In the same way, the governor of a town might actually give up the town and not do his job and defend the city. We keep going with uh, reason is captive. So is captive here goes with reason. Reason is captive and proves weak or untrue. So somebody has taken reason captive. And as we find out later, that is the implication here is that that is the devil. Okay. And then we get to this turn here. So he says, yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain. So fain means something like gladly. I would gladly be loved in return, but am betrothed unto your enemy. So there finally is the devil, right? God's enemy. And this introduces one more major metaphor here, and that's the idea of marriage. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. So when we think about the marriage metaphor, I think the, the text that's really behind this and there are other biblical passages as well, but there's, there's one text I think that really demonstrates what John Donne is talking about, and that's Ephesians 5. So Ephesians 5 talks a lot about marriage, and the basic idea here is that there's an analogy that the writer of Ephesians is working with. And this is the idea that if a wife is married to her husband, then we can compare that to the relationship between church, the church and Christ. Okay? And in fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, to the Song of Songs, the Song of Songs is this beautiful love poem. And a lot of theologians over the centuries have interpreted it as, as being about this analogy as well, which may be a bit of a stretch uh, at times. <laughs> they may be reading some things into the text. But there's definitely this beautiful analogy from the New Testament that allows us to make sense of uh, these two things and how they compare to each other, right? And you can pause the video and read the text here yourself, uh, but that's the basic idea in this case. So if we go back then and we think about that and we think of how Christ relates to his church or to the individual in the church, and then we think about how a husband and a wife relate to each other, then we can really make sense of the imagery in this part of the poem. So he says, I love you, but I am betrothed unto your enemy. It's like I'm about to marry the devil. And so he says, divorce me, untie or break that knot again, right? If I'm going to be married, you have to come by and squash those wedding vows, that betrothal. Let's get rid of that. He says, take me to you, imprison me, for I, there's a comma there that has kind of gone missing, uh, for I accept you and thrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. So the idea here is that God needs to come in violently and take him away, and that's the only way to make him chaste in relation to God. Now, by chastity, we don't mean the same thing as virginity. Okay, so if you are a virgin, that means that you've had no sexual relationships uh, with anybody. But this is not what that means. You can be chaste within marriage. You can be married and have sexual relations with your wife or your, your husband. Um, but as long as you are faithful to them, you are being chaste. And so that's the idea here, that, that in order for John Donne to be chaste to one person, to God, he has to be divorced from the devil and he has to be rescued, in a sense, if we think of this town metaphor again, right? He has to be rescued uh, and taken over. And that relates then to this other kind of paradox in here, um, where he says, except you enthrall me, you enslave me and imprison me, I will never be free. That's the idea that true freedom is still a kind of service or servitude to somebody else. We are free when we are slaves or servants of God. And that's an interesting paradox as well. That's, that's definitely uh, very much a New Testament paradox. 
And then we have this last word here, ravish, and that one has caused a little bit of controversy and confusion. And I'll try to explain why. So the word ravish traditionally has the same root or the same etymology, right? Etymology is the root of the word. And it has the same etymology as the word rape. And that's why this is a little bit confusing. You see, both of these words go back to Latin. And in Latin, this word has very much to do with seizing something. So rapire is to seize something. <clears throat> But in English, the word ravish then, over time, it has come to mean really three things. So the first one is to seize something. The second one is to be enraptured by something, right? If you look at a beautiful scene and you say that is such a ravishing scene. And then the third one is to rape, to ravish someone. Kind of archaic, not many people use this anymore, but it is one of the meanings of ravish. So what do we do with this? Is he asking God to rape him? Well, not necessarily. Um, I don't think it, he's really asking uh, you know, for a kind of straightforward rape. I mean, that seems scandalous. But he is thinking of a particular idea within classical mythology. And that's the idea of raptus, or of being seized. So I have an image here that, that allows you to think about that. And this is a depiction of the rape of Proserpina, um, a statue by Bernini. And in here you have Pluto, the god of the underworld, taking Proserpina, also known as Persephone, and abducting her, taking her to the underworld, and he makes her his queen. That's the notion of ravish, I think, that John Donne has in the background here. On the surface, he, he just means, well, please seize me, take me away. But deeper down, there's this sense of raptus, of being abducted and taken away to some kind of some other kind of realm. And you can probably see the similarities here uh, between a god coming down and seizing a maiden, and then also uh, God, the Trinity, coming and seizing John Donne. Is that scandalous? Is it pushing it a little bit too far? Um, well, he's definitely playing with language, and he is trying to get to another paradox, right? And the last paradox here is this notion that he has to be abducted. He has to be seized and taken away from somebody else in order to be chaste and faithful. That's a very strange kind of paradox. So hopefully that allows you to make some sense of the poem then. And to sum up, I think this poem is powerful not just because it has these these violent images and these paradoxes, but also because I think it plays with an issue that was very prevalent during uh, the time period after the Reformation, during the Renaissance. And this is the issue of how are you actually saved? Is it God who comes down and does all the work and seizes you and puts faith into your heart, he breathes into you, and he does all of these things or do you have some role to play? And I think on the surface, it seems like this poem is very much saying, God does everything, right? I mean, that's really what the poem seems to say. You have to rescue me because I'm sinful by myself. Reason isn't helping. This is not going well. And yet there is a kind of reaching out as well. He, he does say, yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain. He is kind of reaching out and saying, I'm writing a sonnet to talk to you. So the very act of writing the sonnet is kind of me saying, I do still care about you. I want you to be in my heart, but you're going to have to do the lion's share of the work. Now, where does this land exactly in terms of those theological positions? I'm not going to take a stand on that. But at least I'd like you to see that there might be a final kind of paradox in the very way of asking this question to God and reaching out uh, and trying to draw close to the divine.